Um, I'm really uh, very happy to be here tonight uh, to entertain and immiserate you. <laughs> As I believe in old-fashioned things like research, evidence, and policy based on evidence. I think most of you do too. And I would, I'd really like to thank you for to contributing to an organization that provides research and thoughtful policy suggestions. I suspect we will need policy wonks and number nerds more than ever for the next couple of years. It's very strange that what is essentially a very modest, cautious, one might even say a small c conservative position, namely that we should run the numbers, or that we should look at how this particular policy has worked out in other jurisdictions on Earth, uh, that this has somehow become uh, whining, naysaying, or you know, the most radical leftism. You know, I probably would have paid more attention in high school math class if I knew that basic ciphering was so subversive and stick it to the man. <laughs> One of the things that I find really galling and baffling about many of the policy decisions of our current governments is that they are fundamentally faith-based, built on a pseudo foundation of feelings and wishes. Oh, am I unhearable? Am I too close? Oh, I'm sorry. Should I sing? <laughs> I shouldn't. <laughs> Never. I'm better at the, what do we want? What do we want? That's, that's what my voice was made for. Um, one of the things I find really galling and baffling about many of the policy decisions of current governments is that they are fundamentally faith-based, built on a pseudo-foundation of feelings and wishes and bias and baffle gab even as their advocates claim that they're being businesslike or dealing with harsh economic realities. I'd love to know where this wor real world they keep talking about is, because we've been trying the things that they keep suggesting, from tax cuts to convention centers, in the great laboratory of life since the 1980s, and they have yet to work as advertised. To give just one recent and glaring example of this hostility towards evidence, a few weeks ago, our Justice Minister, Rob Nicholson, speaking in support of that exceedingly costly omnibus crime bill, declared flat out, we're not governing on the basis of the latest statistics. I am of three minds about this statement. <laughs> the part of me that cares about evidence-based policy says, yikes, or just fuck. <laughs> like fuck with 47 U's, <laughs> what that part of me says. Uh, the other part of me that is surpassingly sick of this particular government's brand of spin says, well, that's a refreshing moment of candor. <laughs> <laughs> and then the part of me that makes jokes so I can cope with the other two parts says, oh, gee, I guess they do have a youth unemployment plan after all. <laughs> Can't you just see the action plan ads for our safety sector? <laughs> Promising our precious Canucklings exciting opportunities in the high growth fields of wardening, guarding, or inmating. <laughs> Finally, we'll have the chance to compete with global Kuskow <coughs> powerhouses like China and America in a totally literal cage match. Now, we've seen how awesome tough on crime policies have worked out for the neighbors, and one thing American researchers have learned from their national experiment in the field of incarceration is that prison is the anti-university. A degree, even the mock, oft mocked liberal arts degree, still results in a lifetime earnings bump. 
But a short stint in prison reduces a person's earning potential for the rest of their lives, which is indubitably a factor driving the recidivism rate. Right? So, you know, leave aside the fact that investing in imprisonment is, you know, unjust, inhumane, grotesquely discriminatory. It's also economically perverse to squander billions of dollars and thousands of young lives to expand a drain on the allegedly strained public purse. In 2008, we spent roughly 1.6 billion to keep people in cells. Now, even before they've passed Omnicrime, that's up to three billion. Jails also have uh, other pernicious effects on the allegedly all-important economy. They drag wages down, since they're a wonderful source of domestic slave labor. Uh, there's actually a company in the States called Unicor. It was formerly known as Federal Prison Industries. And they brag, this is a direct quote, you can't write things this funny. Imagine all the benefits of domestic outsourcing at offshore prices. <laughs> It's the best kept secret in outsourcing, right? Yeah, they don't want people knowing that your credit card numbers are being handed to felons, right? So you can see why that would be a well-kept secret in outsourcing, right? Um, and of course, you know, prisons also distort the real unemployment rate and, you know, again, deny the ravenous, all-important markets, some beloved consumers. So this right here is the thing I find most infuriating about this federal government and right-wing governments in general. It's not that they fail to live up to my utopian social justice standards, right? I'm not young, optimistic, or drunk enough to expect that. <laughs> it's that they bang on and on and on about the economy as though they are managing a market instead of leading a country while they rack up structural deficits and exacerbate economic inequality in a host of ways through regressive tax policy, pro-corporate behemoth trade policy, public service spending cuts, union bashing, and a deregulatory bent that can only accelerate environmental damage, fiscal chicanery, and wage erosion. The Omnicron bill is a tragic waste of resources because it is based on feelings. <laughs> and because it flies in the face of the demographic facts. One of the few silver linings of our graying population is a steady decline in the crime rate, a trend that has been consistent since the 70s. It's like, try and think of another trend that's been consistent since the 70s. <laughs> Yeah, that's true, that's a sad one. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how young people are supposed to pay for the hospital rooms their parents and grandparents will need and the cells that will confine their unfortunate friends and sketchy cousins. <laughs> this is why I'm very glad the nice people at CCPA chose this exceedingly cheery topic. <laughs> Sorry, kids. Your future is canceled. When they were kind enough to invite me, I actually sent them like a buffet of different variations on the theme of things are not that great right now was you know the main theme. Uh, but I'm glad they picked the one that's closest to my heart. Uh, because of my day job, uh, I'm a professor. Uh, I love my work. I, I'm very lucky, I love my work. Uh, and I really, really like most of the young people I meet in school. And I'm not just saying that because there's a bunch of them here. <laughs> it's written before I saw any of y'all. <laughs> Type, proof. Uh, so the future is, you know, a thing I worry about fairly often, right? Like, I think we should have one. <laughs> And it really, it makes me like furious to think that the brilliant people I see in my classroom every day, like the best offer they're getting is that they can serve coffee at the convention center to people who are visiting us from locations that still have real jobs. <laughs> I mean, this just makes me want to punch things. And uh, you know, 
I do see some disheartening things in my classroom. Uh, let me give you one example, because this one sticks with me and haunts me at night. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was doing a unit uh, in a cultural studies class on the media and politics. And so I asked the class, it was about 50 students, uh, I asked them, you know, who do you guys really trust, right? Are there any journalists or politicians or public figures that you guys believe? <clears throat> A very long, awkward, and stony silence ensued. And then someone at the back of the room mumbled, uh, John Stewart's okay, I guess. <laughs> I mean, on the one hand, I'm kind of relieved that they're not eating very many of the shit sandwiches that our culture hands them, right? Like, nobody was like, I want to be Snooky from Jersey Shore, right? That would have been even more depressing. On the other hand, though, this is really just plain sad. And I think it's got disturbing political consequences we are already starting to see in phenomena like low voter turnout among young people. Now, if the young people I see who have the social and economic support required to attend university are disenfranchised, disgruntled, or distressed, if they do not have much confidence in our institutions or the alleged people who run them, then I shudder to think of how young people who are much worse off, like those who only have high school or less, those people the almighty market are consigning to the scrap heap, must be feeling right now. It really seems like the kids are damned if they don't and damned if they do. If they keep their heads down, do not participate in politics and work merely in their own self-interest, they're apathetic, they're clueless, they're entitled. If they actually get involved in politics proper, they are mocked and criticized for being naive, inexperienced, or in over their heads. I'm sure you all remember that in the weeks after the election, we saw a lot more media scrutiny directed at those rookie Quebec members of parliament in opposition than the incumbents who actually formed the government. Somehow, Ruth Ellen Brusso's vacation merited more concerned column inches than, say, Tony Clement's pork-based triumph in Muskoka. <laughs> I actually did the math. Uh, we all paid $3,571.42. Um, what is that comedy math based on, you ask? Uh, he barely won the last election, uh, and after spending $50 million of taxpayer money on you know, the finest gazebos the world knows, <laughs> uh, he gained an extra 14,000 votes. So that's the math on that. I hope you enjoyed paying for that. Um, it's the gift that keeps on giving, right? <laughs> And of course, right? So I mean, if kids uh, use protests, right, to uh, express their political will, to express their objections to the government's decisions, they're treated like criminals, hooligans, or spoiled brats. We North Americans have spent the last couple of decades shredding essential provisions in the social contract. Many governments have chosen to deal with their ballooning costs by downloading them onto future generations in a couple of different forms, including deficits, deferred costs for infrastructure, diminished social support, and increased user fees like tuition. This is not responsible management. This is just fiscal procrastination. There's a gap, a chasm, an abyss, you could fly one of those swanky new F-35 jets through <laughs> between the things our leaders say about families and children and what they are actually doing for and to young people. Uh, in my first book, which was about bullshit, um, I like to write about things we have a lot of. I don't want to run out in the middle of a book. Uh, <laughs> I argued there that think of the children is the ultimate equal opportunity piety. People on all ends of the political spectrum invoke the kids to advance their particular cause, whether it is progressive, 
like protecting the environment young people might just need in the future for food eating and air inhaling purposes? <laughs> Or really, really retrograde, like opposing comprehensive sex education because information is the leading cause of homosexuality. <laughs> <laughs> Lamentably, most of this child-centric rhetoric is consistently belied by our policy choices. The majority of Canada's poor, unemployed, and underemployed are the very same youth that we incessantly claim to care about. Here are some really fun statistics that will go terrific with your lasagna. <laughs> Again, the national youth unemployment rate has been at around 14% for over a year. In Nova Scotia, that number is more like 17%, and I imagine it is far, far worse in regions such as Cape Breton and rural Nova Scotia. Of course, those unemployment figures do not include those who have stopped looking, who are underemployed, and those who work in the gray market. Uh, last summer, the student unemployment rate was 17%. And there was this story on cbc.ca that is burned into my brain because uh, it was about the grand total of five, yeah, that's right, five summer jobs available in Cape Breton last summer. Yeah. Uh, just, I got a break from my text here and just note for the record that my first summer job in Cape Breton was selling roses out of a bucket in front of a liquor store. <laughs> It's a pretty 19th century job. I felt like I was in Dickens or something. And, uh, but this is because in Cape Breton, like, people with families to support have all the retail jobs at the mall. That's how bad, yeah. You guys have been to Cape Breton, I'm sure you know. Uh, even when the kids with jobs are not doing that great. A uh, 2010 survey by the Canadian Payroll Association found that two-thirds of workers aged 18 to 34 would be in financial difficulty if they missed one paycheck. 51% of Canadians between the age of 20 and 29 still live with their parents. Ha! <laughs> I hope you do chores or something. <laughs> Are you feeding him cheese? Is that the problem? <laughs> the other thing I'd like to add here, right, is 47% of that 51% actually have jobs, right? Contrary to, yeah, thanks! <laughs> You're, you've got all my stats just here live. It's great. Um, you know, there's a lot of analysis where, you know, these uh, older, certainly more privileged commentators are like, well, you know, they're just living with their parents because they're text messaging and playing video games. And, and you know, I, I really have a problem when people talk about young people being un entitled, right? Like, entitled to what? Entitled to clean up the tar sands, like entitled to $30,000 of student loan debt, like entitled to no work security or pensions, like yeah, real entitled. But you have an iPhone, so everything's okay. Right? <laughs> uh, so yeah, the upshot of this is that, you know, half of our kids from 20 to 29 are employed, but they're not employed enough to afford luxuries like a crappy bachelor apartment. The child poverty rate has increased since the 1990s, and now more than one in seven Canadian children are poor. I don't know if you guys saw this news, but uh, this weekend, Sesame Street is actually introducing a new character. Her name is Lily. She's going to teach Elmo about food insecurity. Which is, of course, a polite euphemism for the fact that one in four American children are going hungry. Right. Uh, that food stamp use is at record highs, right alongside corporate profits. How did that happen? Now, of course, you know, the fine folks at organs like Sun TV, I won't say which organ they are, 
love to claim, right, that any kid with an Xbox or a TV is just fine, right? Is A okay? Like, when I saw this new Muppet, the, the hungriest little Muppet, uh, I noticed she was wearing a necklace. And I could just picture Ezra Levant being like, well, if you're so hungry, why don't you sell that necklace and buy yourself some food, right? I mean, one of the problems here is that, you know, like if she was a good, rugged individualist, she would like eat her necklace, right? Just quit whining and get back to work. Um, it is true, right, that some consumer goods have gotten a lot cheaper, right? Poor people now do have Xboxes, God forbid. Uh, but this has turned out to be one of those cheapnesses that is not cheap at all, which is the standard thing in right-wing policy, a cheapness that is never, ever cheap when you cost it out over the long run. And I'm not even talking about like the John Maynard Keynes, we're all dead long run. I'm talking about like the next couple of years long run. So uh, cheaper electronics, right? They're nice, uh, but they've come at the cost of stagnant wages crappier jobs, and much higher prices for necessary goods such as food, housing, and education, right? So in a similar vein, right, resource industries such as our beloved royal tar sands uh, might be pumping some cash into the Canadian economy, but our increasingly egregious and irresponsible environmental policies are creating ginormous messes those kids are going to have to clean up and also ensuring that Canada will lag well behind smarter countries who actually are developing alternative energy sources. I want to make it clear that I don't think this is like a malicious conspiracy plot type thing, right? I don't think there is actually a cabal or club that meets in a boardroom on Bay Street to plot new ways to fuck the future. Um, but I think that the problem here is a serious lack of long-range vision a long-range vision for the nation, uh, and also the sense that politics is a collective endeavor. That, you know, our politicians are not merely the managers of the great mutual fund that we all swear allegiance to, uh, and that politics is not actually contra our current ruling party, a partisan mechanism for delivering goodies to the folks who vote right, and punishment to the folks who vote wrong. So my main point here is that in a system where political and business leaders seem utterly unwilling or totally incapable of thinking any further than the next election or fiscal quarter, the kids are props at best. You know, it was gonna place on his children and grandchildren. So he said, and here I quote directly, you're either in over your head or are hell-bent in turning us into some European big government wasteland. I won't place one more dollar of debt upon the backs of my kids and grandkids unless we structurally reform the way this town spends money. The Chicago Sun-Times reported that Walsh's kids are already suffering the pernicious effects of whimsical Washington accounting. He owes over $100,000 in child support. <laughs> like you can't, li only life can make those kind of jokes for you. 100 grand in child support. Yeah, I don't think Obama's the one your kids have to worry about. <laughs> Uh, this reminds me, there's another Tea Party image I really love, which is a uh, guy sitting, you know, an old coot, kind of bitter looking. Uh, he's sitting on a rascal scooter and holding up a giant sign that says, Stand up for America. <laughs> it's like, uh, you first, right? <laughs> okay. I mean, even though kids are great for an applause line in a speech, uh, a great addition to any photo op, uh, young people are not a major voting block. Demographically, they're outnumbered and they do not vote as much as they should for a number of reasons. Some of this is apathy. Some of this is insufficient civics education. Some of this is purely cynical, right? They're all crooks. Every government sucks. Why bother? 
But it's important to underline that they get this cynical attitude from politics itself, right? From leaders who gripe about, quote, unnecessary elections, right? I mean, what a slap in the face to people who are actually dying in the streets to get the right to vote. I mean, I don't think there's any such thing as an unnecessary election, but I could make a very long list of unnecessary politicians. <laughs> You know, they insist that government itself is the problem and expensive private sector management consultants, like the wizards from Deloitte that were all paying 90 grand a day uh, to liquidate good jobs. Ouch. Like this is the solution, right? Hand it to the private sector. This is unfortunately a self-perpetuating cycle. Old people are more likely to vote than young people, so politicians from all political parties focus their most enthusiastic pandering efforts on the old, which further alienates young people. For example, in the last election, all three parties focused on pensions, which are a very important issue, but they are also a thing that many young workers suspect will be history, like unto cassette tapes or a VCR by the time we are old. It's perfectly understandable that the parties go where the votes are, but seniors actually have the lowest poverty and debt rates of any demographic wedge, and we are also making more of them. So it might not be such a swell idea to offer them enduring blandishments to achieve the short-term goal of winning elections. Um, I actually wrote an op-ed for the Chronicle Herald about this around election time. Um, I tried to be diplomatic, Right? I did not use phrases like fossils or... <laughs> and uh, this is still not very diplomatic. I'm from Cape Breton. It's amazing I'm speaking English. But, <laughs> you know, I made it very clear that my point in the article was not that I was trying to, you know, start intergenerational warfare. I was just describing a structural problem that we have and will have unless we do something about it. And this, you know, won me a couple of angry letters from curmudgeons who insisted that I was, in fact, fomenting intergenerational warfare. Uh, so I'm of two minds about this as well. I mean, on the one hand, intergenerational warfare is a divide and conquer strategy, right? It's another way to make sure that the people who have not are squabbling amongst themselves while the people who have consolidate their gains. But on the other hand, I also think intergenerational warfare is like Warren Buffett's joke about class warfare, right? Yes, of course there's a class war and my class is winning. Right. That's a joke. That's Warren Buffett's joke, right? He's at least admitting what's happening, which is more than you can say for most billionaires who think they're just that awesome. Like, I was really disappointed to hear about Steve Jobs. I'm like, they die? I had no idea. Why make a billion dollars if you're just going to die like a regular person, right? <laughs> I didn't know they could die. <laughs> so, I mean, what I want to say here is that older Canadians do still enjoy some public blandishments because they came of age when people still believed in and were willing to invest in an efficacious public sphere. Younger Canadians are growing up in an age when our political classes deny the efficacy of the public sector and insist that the private sector should play a bigger role in or serve as the yardstick for historically public services such as healthcare and education. And they do this in spite of the stacks of research showing that France is a much better place to get sick than Detroit. <laughs> or in spite of the fact that you know, they themselves benefited and arguably continue to benefit from greater public funding for services such as education. So the potential for tension between young workers and older retirees is only going to increase as the ratio of workers to retirees changes. According to StatsCan in 1981, there were six working Canadians for every retiree. By 2031, they estimate that there will be just three. 
working Canadians for every retiree. Uh, this is why I call smokes and poutine Freedom 65. That's my plan. I'm just going to join the billionaires in the great beyond. <laughs> this is going to have, you know, pretty serious consequences on the revenue side and on the cost side, the most obvious being uh, that aging boomers will undoubtedly place more pressure on health care, which is already roughly half of our budget here in Nova Scotia. It's gonna be exceedingly difficult for a shrinking tax base to cope with rising costs, especially when that smaller tax base also enjoys reduced tax rates and lowered spottier incomes thanks to the decrease in union membership and the increase in contract and short-term employment. Moreover, a number of studies have also suggested that people who enter the labor market during periods of high unemployment suffer a persistent earnings lag one such study by Yale economist Lisa Kahn found that, quote, five, 10, 15 years after graduation, after untold promotions and career changes spanning booms and busts, the unlucky graduates never closed the gap. 17 years after graduation, those who had entered the workforce during inhospitable times were still earning 10% less on average than those who had emerged into a more bountiful climate. So she lists a few reasons why this lag persists. People who enter a weak job market have fewer good choices, obviously, but they are also afterwards, even when they get a job, more gun-shy and cowed, less likely to take chances later, less likely to switch jobs, less likely to start businesses. Ponder that, right? This means that that entrepreneurial spirit right-wingers lo right love to go on about, like it's Santa or Jesus or something, <laughs> is in fact imperiled by the economic conditions their policies create why the economic trends for young people have gotten so gloomy that even some of our top plutocrats have taken notice and emitted concerned harumphs. A couple of weeks ago, New York billionaire, business dude, and mayor, Michael Bloomberg, fretted about it on his radio show. Quote, you have a lot of kids graduating college who can't find jobs. That's what happened in Cairo. That's what happened in Madrid. You don't want those kinds of riots here. Closer to home, a retired Encana CEO and pro-business cheerleader, Gwyn Morgan, held forth in the Globe and Mail thus, quote, youth of every race, culture, and language share one universal aspiration, the opportunity to lift themselves out of poverty to a better future through employment. Where there is no hope to do that, there can be only anger. Suffice it to say that I am not exactly used to agreeing with the likes of Gwyn Morgan and will require an extra large alcoholic beverage to wash his name out of my mouth when I'm done speaking. But I mention this only to underscore the fact that the economy guys that our political guys slavishly worship have also noticed that we have an economic problem that might just blossom into a garden of expensive social problems. Our demographic problems aren't as pronounced as the ones driving events in Cairo, but the Vancouver riots and our response to them somehow seem a lot worse than your average post-game orgy of drunken Hulk smashery. <laughs> Moreover, if we look at what's happening in places like Britain that are demographically closer to us, we see that tuition and anti-austerity protests and the more recent riots do involve a lot of shockingly young people. I mean, there were some protesters in the tuition rallies who were still in junior high, right? Like the youngest rioter they arrested was 11. Now, I'm not justifying the actions of looters and rioters, but I do think that the British riots are proof of you know, we finally found something that trickles down. <laughs> Money never seems to trickle down as promised, but nihilism certainly does. 
The difference between a bailed out bankster and a kid liberating some sneakers from a department store is a difference of degree, not kind. They're both getting what's theirs. <laughs> and telling society, the public, the community to go hang. Political and business leaders have created a values vacuum, a public void they keep trying to stuff with private interests. <laughs> But an aggregate of competing private interests is no substitute for shared goals, for a public imagination that spans and gathers generations. In fact, I'd even go so far to say that this impoverished conception of politics, the idea that government just guards our individual fortunes, is one of the things that makes kids cynical about politics and ensures that they never exercise their franchise. There was a phrase that kept coming up this summer during the postal lockout. Not strike, lockout. <laughs> that I think is pretty revealing. One of the things that the Canadian Union of Postal Workers were fighting against, one of the things that several of the new NDP MPs brought up during the lengthy filibuster was a thing called the Orphan Clause. The Orphan Clause, for those of you who are maybe not so familiar with labor issues, allows employers to create two-tier workplaces. People who are joining the organization get a much crummier deal than their coworkers. And this isn't just the usual entry level, earn your bones, work your way up kind of thing, right? Most unions sensibly support that. Rather, Orphan Clauses tell new workers that they cannot and should not expect the same benefits, compensation, and working conditions that their colleagues and unions have negotiated previously. Frankly, I think a lot of North American political and fiscal institutions are invoking the orphan clause right now, insisting it is no longer feasible to provide affordable education and training. It's no longer reasonable to expect a decent wage, benefits, or a pension don't let the fact that the GDP is much bigger than it was back in the day fool ya, kids. Good pay is so yesteryear. <laughs> Why not take an unpaid internship or volunteer at your dream company? Your salary of nothing should really help you put a dent in that student loan debt. I wish this was just a joke, but I was actually on a panel last year for CBC and uh, a student asked us, you know, how am I supposed to get into the job market? How am I supposed to pay off my giant loan? And one of my distinguished co-panelists from the Atlantic Provinces Economic Council suggested that students volunteer to build their resumes. I don't think pay a lot more for your degree and then work for squat is a winning economic formula. <laughs> What can you expect from, I hesitate to use the word think tank here, right? Like, belief tank, right? Faith-based tank, right? I mean, what do you expect from people like APAC or the Atlantic Institute for Market Studies, right? These would be the same people who spent the entire 90s Entire 90s, Ireland, Ireland, let's be like the Celtic tiger. We should be like the Celtic tiger. Oh my God, we should so cut our taxes. Like, have you seen what Ireland's doing? It's so amazing, right? And not one of them, like I keep waiting, like hoping I'll open up my Chronicle Herald and there will be, uh, you know, my bad, Brian Lee Crowley. <laughs> you know, nobody's taking that shit back, right? Now that, you know, the entire land has been pillaged and burned by bankers in a fashion that might make the Irish wish the British would come back. <laughs> nice. And you know, the Celtic tiger is looking more like a mangy, piebald alley cat. Right? I mean, again, this is a good example of how this kind of market fundamentalism is more faith or belief than a science, a techne, or an expertise, right? I mean, I've spent a lot of time on the economy in this talk, 
partially because politics has in some ways been reduced to economic management with the occasional symbolic flourish, like inserting royal back into our institutional <laughs> names. <laughs> I'm waiting for Royal Canadian Tar Sands. Oh, sorry. Oil Sands. A lot of people paid a lot of PR money to change those three-letter words. Uh, or, you know, gilding John Barrett's Canada-free business cards, right? I'm fine with him not having Canada on his business cards. It's, it's preferable. I'm focusing on the economy uh, is that these kind of economic problems lead to social ones, right? It's absolutely inevitable. Uh, they threaten and corrode the social cohesion and sense of community that makes Canada a civilized, livable country. When we cut programs impoverished children need, we are again indulging in a cheapness that does not turn out to be cheap at all, insofar as that early neglect will only lead to increased costs in some other sector, such as justice or health or decreased productivity. Creating an underclass and a criminal class is an investment, one with several costs and a few, business, a few benefits, right? I mean, it's really only beneficial if you're like a private prison contractor. That's exactly who benefits from that. Um, I can't wait to see Her Royal Majesty's permanent underclass. That has a real <laughs> ring to it. When we slash education funding, for example, we undermine something much bigger than young people's purchasing power, or even the education system itself. We undermine the very idea that we're all in this society thing together, right? This is a pretty simple idea, and it's one that helped foster North America's long boom from the end of the Second World War to the 70s. Help the young through daycare and school, then they can grow up to be viable economic and social units and help pay for roads and hospitals and the school their kids are gonna go to. But this idea of the public has been absolutely under siege for the past three decades. And while I freely concede that we cannot just go back to the good old days of the long boom, I would like to note that other nations, most notably our Scandinavian friends, continue to exist <laughs> to trade freely and outdo us on a number of indicators like health and crime, all the while living under the twin blights of progressive taxation and social democracy. <laughs> How do they find the strength to carry on in Denmark, I wonder. <laughs> the two points I've tried to make here tonight are actually just two different sides of the same point. We're in a real demographic and fiscal crunch. There are not enough young people relative to our population of older people, and many of these young people do not have the kind of jobs that provide the kind of income they need to breed more young Canucklings or to sustain the tax base. Second, even if they could pay, right, even if every last one of them somehow, in defiance of the laws of math, manages to you know, live the Harperite dream and become a high paid warden, or get a <laughs> six figure job in the tar sands, or you know, strike it rich as a conservative party functionary, right? Or John Baird's business card gilder. Right? <laughs> they might not be inclined to help underwrite the golden years of the people who taught them that government just messes everything up, that the private sector is always a waste, the taxes are pure evil, and everyone Everyone should pay their own damn way, get back to work, and quit bitching. It's, been pretty, it's become pretty commonplace to look at the services our young people use, most notably education, in terms of their return on investment. This was certainly the view of last year's O'Neill report. And even O'Neill, in his capacity as the government's official poor mouther and human shield, 
called the O'Neill Report for a reason, people. He's not around no more. Uh, he had to concede the glaringly obvious, that universities bring a lot of money and much needed young people to our aging province. Fortunately for my purposes, as someone who has to give a speech, the nice folks at the Halifax Chamber of Commerce, conveniently located in the Burnside Industrial Park, <laughs> made no such concessions to reality. In their response to the O'Neill Report, they insisted that he did not go far enough. Why does every damn university insist on having people work at it? <laughs> If we just fired all those overpaid jerks in registrar's offices, why, Nova Scotia could reduce the oppressive tax yoke on our heroic business folk. This is brain bruisingly stupid for a couple of reasons. First, I have heard many, 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 many complaints from students over the past decade or so, and not one of them has ever bitched about the speedy dispatch of the overpaid, overstaffed registrar's office. Oh my god, it was so fast, I didn't even know it was happening, right? That, that is not a complaint I have ever heard, and I've heard a lot. Second of all, where did the economic geniuses of the chamber think the assistant sub-sub registrar's salary goes? Chances are pretty good that those funds end up in the coffers of the chamber's membership. Who do they think is filling their bars and restaurants and clothing shops? That would be all those students we have way too many of. Those students are also doing the chamber another big favor, insofar as they are a wonderful, transient, and cheap labor pool that help depress wages in Halifax. But you never know this from reading the chamber's response, which is the usual, totally predictable, taxes, grrr, waste, grrr, bullshit as though the world has not changed at all since the early 1980s when this sort of cheapness that is not cheap at all first became popular. I mean, you know, as someone who is technically employed by the public, I make sure I take my salary and throw it directly into the harbor as soon as I get it, right? Because any public spending is just a waste, right? Like, infuriating. I mention this not just because it really, really, really pisses me off, uh, but also because I think a similar self-defeating and narrow logic is at work when we talk about issues like education funding and youth employment. I mean, look, the more student loan debt kids rack up, the less likely they will be to buy that house you're planning on selling when you retire. Moreover, a bunch of people who will likely need a new hip where a spot in a senior's home might not want to spend so much time drilling the phrase return on investment into malleable young minds. <laughs> what exactly, what exactly is the return on investment when my grandma, who is like 108, uh, has her umpteenth medical procedure? Zip, zero, zilch. Chance to pay for another one next year, right? I hope you found that question as morally grotesque as I intended it to be. That was not, that was totally not a serious question. Uh, but again, right, this is not why we have healthcare, right? We don't have healthcare because we get good return on investment from it, even though technically we do, right? There's plenty of organs like Forbes and The Economist who have said that Canada is a much better place to do business than the neighbors because employers don't have to deal with you know, a private healthcare system. But again, that's not why we have healthcare, right? And I really hope that you found that question just as morally grotesque as I hoped it would be. So why do we get to ask that question when someone goes to school? Again, even though this seems like, you know, this fiscal responsibility that people are loving to talk about but not actually practice, 
you know, this rests on a few faulty assumptions. First, that there is still such a thing as a surefire major or a lifetime job, which is less and less the case. Most young people entering the job market will have eight to 10 different jobs over the course of their adult lives and will require flexible skills, the kind of skills you get in the much maligned bachelor's degree to jump from employer to employer. Second, we are piss poor at making economic predictions. You can count on one hand with fingers to spare the number of economists who warned us that that giant meltdown thingy in 2008 were coming, was coming, right? Third, when we actually do make these kind of economic predictions, they become self-defeating prophecies. As a glut of young lawyers or our IT professionals bum rush the job market and drag wages down. Fourth, this analysis conflates two phenomena, the majors kids choose and the structural problems with the current economy. I mean, I seriously wish too many people majoring in artsy fartsy stuff like English had the power to jam the gears of capital. <laughs> this is patently not the case. I mean, first of all, fewer kids are doing uh, the degrees they always complain about, your liberal <laughs> arts and humanities. They've been surpassed in popularity by the get-a-job majors, such as business. But the big thing is that our politicos and pundits are eager to blame our structural economic difficulties on anyone but themselves or the almighty job creators. And universities, with their meddlesome evidence and research, make a terrific scapegoat in pseudo-populist times. I think the fact that we expect young people to give us a good return on investment, that we want our kids to pay out like so many little slot machines, is indisputable proof that the social contract is in peril. And it is up to all of us to do the math, do the research, to show that the social contract is not just just or necessary, but actually much more cost effective than the short-sighted alternative, this cheapness that is not cheap at all. I also <coughs> fear that this logic will ultimately come back and bite those who propound it squarely on the earth when they require healthcare or support in their old age. Um, I'd like to close with a quote from a movie from my misspent youth, uh, The Breakfast Club. <laughs> this is a scene between the principal and the janitor. The principal says, you think about this. When you get old, these kids, when I get old, they're going to be running the country. Carl, yeah. Now this is the thought that wakes me up in the middle of the night, that when I get older, these kids are gonna take care of me. I wouldn't count on it. <laughs> <laughs>